Okay, so we're going to get going now. And uh, firstly, thanks everyone for joining. It's fantastic. You've given up some of your time to come and hopefully learn about experimentation. And the intention of this webinar is to be very practical um, and to really make sure that you go away from this with some great content and some great actions that you can use in your own businesses. So um, the title is how to add 4 million of revenue by experimenting with your UX. And we're gonna come on to that later on in the webinar with a real case study of a very well-known brand who achieved fantastic results uh, and actually working alongside Johnny. So he's gonna talk to you through that in a bit. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, um, we are recording the webinar, so we will distribute this at the end um, and send all that around to everyone. Uh, we want to make this as much more of a discussion as possible, so to keep it interactive, rather than listening to us uh, talk at you for 35 minutes, add questions as they come up, if you think it's relevant to the point of conversation, or if you disagree with us, or agree with us, or something else, let us know in the chat, and uh, we'll be monitoring that permanently. So feel free to ask at any point, and um, if we can, we'll introduce it into the, into the flow at that point as well, which should keep it engaging. Um, there'll also be a fixed Q&A session at the end. Uh, also, as a big thank you to everyone who's joining, we've got the equivalent of merch, merchandise at the end. So there are some really cool things we've got to offer you, at no cost to you that you can take away from this that we hope will make a difference to your own experimentation capabilities. So um, at the end of the webinar, there'll be a, we'll explain what those are and, and how to get your hands on them. So um, I think that is it for housekeeping. So just moving on quickly, who are we? Um, you've got Johnny and me. I'll let Johnny introduce himself. Much more interesting for him talking then. I'll give you a quick 30 seconds and then we'll get straight into the meat of the presentation. Thank you very much, Charlie. Hello, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for joining. Uh, so I'm Johnny. I'm the Digital Experience Director of a performance marketing agency called Journey Further. As an agency, we do paid media, organic search, and we have a creative and strategy team as well. I look after the Digital Experience Division, um, where we predominantly do full service conversion optimization or experimentation services for our clients, but we also sell UX projects and we uh, do a lot of services around software in that area as well. Uh, I have a very long background in all of this. I've been in, in digital experimentation for 15 years, including building and running um, the in-house experimentation function at Sky in the UK. So that's me. Cool, thanks, Johnny. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we've partnered with journey further for not just this webinar but also to help our clients who are as we've discovered over the last few years many of you who are on here are clients or many of you who aren't um, yet clients are at a point in the journey where it's not just about buying tools it's about implementing those and getting the most from them and actually getting the results because let's face it you don't spend money on tools like iquant or a b testing tools whatever it is for the sake of it you spend it because you want to drive a business outcome and uh, we, we search the market to find the best agency uh, consulting organization in this field of experimentation. And um, that's why we've partnered with Journey Further and Johnny and his team to bring their expertise to our clients to help them on their experimentation journey. Um, iQuant, uh, what do we do? So we're enabling design, e-commerce and marketing customers to cut design time remove subjectivity and exceed their business results using AI that simulates how the human eye behaves. Uh, that allows us to generate data early in the creative life cycle before content is launched. So that's the key takeaway about iQuant there. We, we generate using our AI, we're generating data before you go live, which is actually pretty revolutionary if you think about how, like, how you get any type of data today, probably mostly around using customer testing. And uh, we've been in AI for some quite some years now. Um, and thanks to ChatGPT, it's having its moment in the sun. So uh, yeah, that's what we do. Anyway, that's enough about us. Uh, what are you going to learn from this webinar? That's probably what you're asking. What's in this for you? So uh, you'll see here, these are some of the things we're going to cover. The fundamentals you need to follow to start experimenting. 
This is to give you the baseline. What are the things, the raw ingredients you need? Understanding if you have the right skill sets in house, really, really important. Um, I was speaking to a very large energy, direct to consumer energy uh, client end of last year. And they said, we really want to get going with experimentation, but we've realized everyone knows a little bit about it, but there's no experts in house. We're just going to make loads of mistakes. And we need to go away and build our team in that area. It's so important. Uh, how to select the right tools, when to use an agency, and when you don't need an agency as well. Um, how to generate meaningful hypotheses. These are really important. These are the, if you like, the DNA of a great experiment. So we're going to talk a bit about that. And um, we're going to talk about statistical significance because it's something everyone talks about when it comes to A-B testing. But that basically means how to know when you can trust the data. Um, so um, in terms of the next um, 25 minutes, uh, John is going to take us through some great examples of how good intentions can result in worse business performance. We've all set out to achieve something, had a great idea. Maybe we've believed it for a long time and we've launched the experiment and it's gone south. So John is going to share some really interesting, cool examples of that. Then we're going to give everyone a chance to take a quick experimentation readiness test. We'll come up as a poll, It'll be like a few minutes, that's all. And you'll get a score at the end of it. And that will help you identify where you are in the experimentation journey and we'll match, we'll explain to you where all the customers we speak to. So you can get a rough idea of, of your maturity in that area. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about experimenting, bringing the right culture in, pl in place. And then we're going to finish with a deep dive into a recent project with Liberty of London, uh, a very well known brand, uh, e-commerce and physical retail brand based here in London um, that resulted in outstanding results. And we're going to help you learn how to replicate those, which is ultimately what you want to know, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, Johnny, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. So um, I, I start most of my conversations with people when I'm talking about experimentation with this same slide. Um, it's a very, very important piece of data that just demonstrates the value of, of running experimentation. So um, you may well have heard of the A-B testing platform Optimizely. Well, Optimizely partnered with Harvard Business School around it was about three years ago, I guess now. And they passed all of the experiments that had ever been running Optimizely um, to Harvard Business School, who were doing all sorts of analysis around very nuanced things. But the overarching thing that came out of it was that of 22,000 different tests run on websites from over 1,350 different websites, um, only one in 10 of those changes could actually demonstrate a, a, a positive impact. Nine in 10 of them, or well, eight in 10 of them didn't do anything or could at least couldn't demonstrate any impact. And one in 10 of them had the opposite effect. Um, now, when you run tests, I've been running tests on websites for 15 years, and you don't really need this kind of stat to tell you what you already know. Um, this is just a fact of life. It's very hard to find the things that work on websites. Now, this, this is about tests that have been running optimizely, but this is 22,000 things that people thought were a good idea. Um, things they thought they should do to their website, and only one in 10 of them actually worked. So the other way to look at that is that nine out of the 10, 90% of what you do is potentially a waste of time. And there's a few examples here of just, just trying to highlight the dangers inherent in making what are effectively guesses. So I actually used to work for this company. I used to be the e-commerce director of this company. Um, it's a hotel business. And a um, bit of a story behind this one. When I started working there, I was quite shocked that, that TripAdvisor review scores weren't displayed on the website. Um, all of the hotels had very good TripAdvisor review scores. So you'd think, why wouldn't you put them on the, on the site? Um, the whole objective is to drive direct bookings. And, uh, and I wanted to do it, but we had a brand manager at the time who was absolutely dead against it. Um, and this made me even more convinced that I wanted to do it and, and more convinced that it would work because we had this bit of um, challenge going on. And he, months and months and months later, he eventually left and, um, and I was able to then test it. And I tested it on the site and just having the TripAdvisor review score there actually decreased the conversion rate by 12% across the entire website. Um, so it's sort of- Just yeah. by adding that box. Just by adding that box, just by adding the review score. 
what you could see as well, what we saw from the data was that it, it basically causes people to leave the site. So even though you can't click it, people probably think, well, I'm, maybe you're not telling me the truth. I'm going to go and look at TripAdvisor. And TripAdvisor is a meta search engine. So once you're in there, you might be looking at other hotels. Um, but the moral of the story really is that, you know, you, you will end up being convinced of something for very particular reasons that have got nothing to do with how customers are going to behave. And you just can never guess exactly how people are going to behave. There's no such thing as a best practice. You have to test everything. If you flick onto the that, next one. Yeah, yeah sure. go on, and that's sorry. all about the unintended consequences, isn't it? It's the, it's, you can't quite imagine how adding, you think it makes common sense, right? Adding in those, those 4.6 stars, it's a social proof. Uh, you know, people are thinking this is, these are great hotels. But as you say, the unintended consequences um, causes people to think, well, maybe what's the issue here? Why are they doing this? We, quick story to share. I used to work at Lloyd's Banking Group and we were, I, I ran a project to completely relaunch internet banking, the whole UX UI for three large UK brands, Lloyd's, Halifax and Bank of Scotland. And one of the things that uh, we discovered in that was the more you talk about security, the more people fear it, the more people fear um, the problems associated with poor security because you're reminding them of it. You know, we're talking about internet banking is super safe and secure, 100% protected. The more we talked about that, the more we had visuals, the more people reacted negatively to that because it made them think, well, why, what, what's the problem? So very interesting. Yeah. Next slide coming up. Yeah, so um, this is a, a, a gifting company that we were working with some time ago. And the story behind this is um, they had um, done a piece of analysis which showed that people who viewed video content were more likely to buy. Um, and what they'd then done is go and invest in hiring a guy to come and basically make a load of video content of their products. So they were paying this guy to make video content. And on all of the products, so you have that little play video link that you can see on the right-hand side. Um, they were updating all of their product pages to include this video. But obviously, that analysis suffers from that correlation causation problem. You know, just because people who watch videos are more likely to buy doesn't mean it's because of the video. So we wanted to test how effective videos were. And the test was actually a kind of a negative test in a way because we removed the videos. Um, but the stat there is basically saying that having videos reduces the conversion rate by 4%. So even though they'd, they'd effectively thought that, you know, videos were really engaging and they were going and spending a load of money on putting them on the site, actually having a videos was a bad thing um and um you know again you um, will easily be able to find a list of best practices on you know or tons of different lists of best practices on the web that will say have as much possible you know photograph and video content as you possibly can about your products you know it's a pretty well regarded best practice but again in this case nonsense because it doesn't work <laughs> And, um, you know, you, but you never know, you could, you could do this exact same thing on another website and it would have the complete opposite effect and the video content would work really well. You just don't know. So that's the thing, you know, you have to test. And, and there's one of the- Test everything is what your, your, your mantra is. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and one final one. Um, so this is a, a, a company that sells towels and bedding. Um, and it's a bit of a spot the difference one, this one, because the only difference on the right hand side is that little bit of blue text that says free returns with collect plus on all orders. So um, this, uh, this actually came about from a very thorough piece of research where we found that the kind of the elephant in the room for this brand is that you're, when you're buying towels, you can't feel them like people, people really like to go into stores and feel towels and feel the quality of them. And you can't do that when you're buying online. Um, and so the reason we actually put this there in the first place was to try and encourage people that they could buy and that they could send them back if they weren't happy. That is, you know, trying to replicate that experience. But just that bit of blue text there, just that thing that says free returns actually reduced the whole conversion rate of the site by 13%, um, which is absolutely baffling. I mean, we nearly even didn't test it. You know, it's such a, it's such a small thing and you'd think it was a no brainer. We nearly didn't test it. Um, the only real sort of uh, theory as to why that would be is that the, 
this is a quite an old audience that buy from this site and it might be that that they think why would why would you why would i need to return it what's wrong with it yeah and it, yeah. And it creates the sense that it, there's something wrong with it but again you know the you can imagine that being something that a ux designer would just include in a mm. design when designing a brand new website and you yeah. would have no idea at that point that it wasn't effective so um uh, again uh, you know, sorry john i was going to say and interestingly it's creating a baseline because you might launch with that and and it would be it wouldn't be obvious to take that away if you did launch in this case you knew the impact because you added it in after you launched with the baseline i think that's exactly. something that's really important isn't it is you've got to you've got to establish the baseline and avoid trying to launch with something that's fully i always think fully featured and what you think is perfect in inverted commas and start with what's the simplest transfer of information to the end user that i can achieve and then we can layer on things on top of that to try to drive improvements because if you go too rich too quickly you don't know what it is that's driving a, a, a subpar performance i've just noticed we had a question come in from francesca yeah. which is right. minus four percent conversion rate couldn't it be a natural fall of conversion rate uh, let, let's just talk about what a b testing is just um, i was sort of assuming people know what a b testing is um well, all of these just are... give us the summary john just in case because some people are new on this so yeah yeah just just uh just so you know these examples are controlled experiments where what happens is we um serve serve the the change to 50 percent of the audience randomly so using an a b testing tool people arrive at this page for example half of them see the original half of them see the the change and we measure the difference in conversion rate and the difference is measured using statistical techniques because it's a bit really a form of sampling. So we're uh, using statistical techniques to understand that um, the, the difference that you're seeing is uh, has a high confidence of being due to that change as opposed to just sort of random noise or whatever. So that's been applied to all of these tests. So the 4% decrease in conversion rate is not a natural fall. It's not a before and after test. It's a, it's a controlled experiment to answer that. Thank you. And Francesca, thanks so much for asking the question. And you get 10 points. You can't do anything with the points, I'm afraid, but you've got 10 points. So thank you for having the courage to pop up a question there. Others, please, uh, if you've got anything added in or if you've got any thoughts on what you're seeing, just add it into the chat. Um, we'd love to hear them. As we said, we want to keep this uh, very engaging and, uh, and open to you to, to get involved with. Um, so, um, Johnny, in terms of all of the work you've done across those 15 years and the work at Sky and all the other brands you've worked with, you've developed some golden rules, right? Yeah. So the, you know, the whole point of this section here is just to try and inspire you to think about testing because you, you know, you really can't guess what to do. So number one, there is no such thing as a no brainer. Um, you know, you hear that term a lot, low hanging fruit, mm -hmm. no brainer best practice. Honestly, I, you know, it would be really easy for me to go around telling people I've been doing this 15 years, I know what works. I have no idea because every day we test things that have these sorts of surprising results. So you just cannot guess, you have, you have to use data and where possible experimentation to understand things. Number two, um, even though you don't necessarily realize it, um, you go around using yourself as a focus group. So when you when you work, you're working with a website or you're working on anything like that, you, you it's impossible not to look at it and think, well, I don't like that or I don't like that. And you 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 won't necessarily consciously think like that. You know, you think, well, our customers aren't going to like that. But you're talking about yourself. You know, you you cannot know your customers. You can't know you can't know a hundred people, let alone ten thousand people. So you know you have to recognize that your own opinion is simply your own bias. Um, number three, um, a lot of what happens is copying the competition. So it's very yeah. easy to just look at competitors' websites and go, you know, everybody everybody aspires to be Apple and John Lewis and things like that. I don't know why people aspire to be Apple because their website's not actually that good. Um, but, um, you know, everybody has these sites where they, yeah, <laughs> they, every, everybody has these sites that they look at and, you know, aspire to be. But how do you know they're good? You know, how do you know John Lewis is a good user experience? Um, you know, how, you know, anything like that. So, and also if you copy the competition, 
what you're doing is basically just becoming like the competition, but probably not as good. So, um, you know, mm. just kind of, it would, if everybody copied the competition, everything would be the same. Known before, ultimately you have to use research and, and data. Uh, it's the only way you can get close to what customers actually want. Um, and, you know, there's a spectrum of how well you use research and data, but, um, you know, you, you need to go on that journey. And five... Can, can you is, give, um, sorry, George, to interrupt. can you give people an example of the research they might consider going to do to help inform their tests? Yeah, um, the, the, the sort of, the uh, holy grail really for me is the combination of qualitative and quantitative data. So either trying to find you know a single source of data that brings those into uh, in, into the same thing, or just having a range of tools, um, because you know you, you could go and speak to one customer that would be very qualitative, but it's only one customer, um, uh, or you could look at some data for every single one of your customers, which is very quantitative, but it doesn't necessarily tell you why. So finding the balance between those is good. Surveys are good. Um, but really, it's about having a range of different tools for different sources. Um, and okay. we talk about that later. So we talk about the range of tools that you can use. But the And just on, um, just on that point a bit further, then. so if someone's on, on this thinking, OK, well, how do I weight this? Which one do I do first? If you, if you had to guide people, what would it be? You know, for example, um, first of all, go and get your quant insight. Go and get the stats, the numbers from your BI tools, whatever you're using. Use those form insights and then get qualitative information from users to try to understand why that's happening. Is that one way to do it, or would you start? I think if, if you can only and do, go to quant, what would you do? If you can only do one thing, one of the best places to start is with pop-up surveys on a website. So if you've got a website really? and you've got customers coming there, um, you can use. I mean, Hotjar is a very cheap way of doing it, and mm -hmm. there are better tools like Get Feedback is a very good tool for doing that. But okay. you know, you, you can literally just ask people, you know, if let's say you've got an e-commerce website, you can just say to people, is there anything stopping you from buying today? And you will be surprised mm -hmm. at the amount of people who reply to that and you know, and what they say. Um, and you know, a ton of people will say it's too expensive or things like that that you can't really necessarily do anything about. Um, but you know, lots of people will say, I can't find this or I can't find that. And it, you know, he's and it, that's why I mean it's a good balance of qual and quant yeah. because they're, because they're they're verbatim telling you what's wrong and there's a decent amount of them. So yeah. you know that's that's a good place to start. Um, so but so other than that, feedback you know, and surveys. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but I've got an example of that, Johnny, actually as well, which is um so um my one of my jobs at Lloyd's was to launch. Uh, I was asked to go and build a new iPad. Um, because that's what everyone was doing at the time um, for internet banking. And I reviewed, uh, all, if, if any of you are using NPS surveys on your website, um, which a lot of big brands tend to, you'll be collecting verbatim so that the, they can score the site and then they can also give you feedback. And I reviewed all the verbatims and we classified them. And it turned out that what people, they didn't want was a full iPad app because they had internet banking on their iPad. What they wanted was the same speedy login that they had on mobile. And the biggest frustration for them was login speed, that they had to still go through the desktop login on their iPad, which was clumsy because it was designed for mouse-based interaction. Whereas on your mobile, because it had authenticated and had a different security system, you just needed three numbers of your member of information and you were in. And so that actually informed our whole strategy. We didn't build a whole iPad app. We built a wrapper that had the same login as the mobile app and allowed you to view the desktop site within that wrapper. So that's a really good example, I think, of illustrating what Johnny said, is that go and listen to what people are telling you, because that's where you can get some really, really um, useful insights. Yeah. And the last thing is test everything. Now, um, you can read that in different ways. Um, it's not always possible to run an experiment on everything. But if you if you take testing to mean validation, then you can apply processes that allow you to use a workflow and a process that allows you to validate everything that you do. You know, what, what, yeah. what I've built a career out of is what I like to call the application of the scientific method in a business context. And, um, and really, you know, 
you go wrong if you focus just on running an A-B test. That would be like, you know, asking a scientist what they do and them saying, I run experiments. It's th that's, that's one aspect of what they do. It's the whole process that goes mm. together. So the process around how you run research, come up with ideas, validate them, uh, iterate, go back to the drawing board. That whole process is what I mean by test everything. Um, I've just noticed some, a few questions coming yeah, in. More questions. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Alex, Alex King uh, said a great survey is saying what nearly stopped you from buying. So that's exactly what I was talking about. So great. Thanks for uh, thanks for reiterating that as well. Um, would love to get an example of a case where conversion rate fell due to introduction of certain elements. Well, we've actually got a case study in here. It's not exactly about uh, it's, it's the opposite. It's, it's improving conversion rate, but I will show you an end-to-end -end case study of that as well. Yeah. Um, and very interesting that a test drives positive results on a website that can lead to negative results on another website. Is there also a seasonality component to A-B testing, for example, reaching positive statistical significant results in summer? Um, yeah, absolutely there is, yeah. Um, uh, you know, the I think, you know, it's easy to forget that um, a website and the behavior around it is at any one time a huge proportion of customers and how that customers are made up, the constitution of that group of customers um, can be very different to at one time to another time and it will be very different to two different times. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, people have this sort of simplistic way of looking at here's, a re here's an e-commerce clothing retail website and here's another one so they must be the same what works on one works on the other but what you don't think is that the customers that are at those websites can be utterly utterly fundamentally different in attitude yeah. and everything and you know so that's the thing you're not you know it's not the site it's the group of customers and that that is absolutely true that you know you you might be running a promotion at one point of year and so the customers that you have there will be different to another time of year so yeah that's uh, you know my answer to that would be always remember you know the audience as opposed to the the ux in a way and that's the really i mean that's a really tricky that's a really great question thank you by the way to the three of you that put those questions in there that's that's great that last one though so what you're actually concluding is that i might find that a change an experiment i run in the summer um that also happens to have a different cohort of users in terms of demographics or whatever that particular moment may will generate uh, an improvement in conversion yeah if i was to run the same test at a different point of the year with different users i might get the opposite so Possibly. how on earth yeah how on earth then do you make ongoing decisions that well enable you to continue to grow if there's so much variability in in, in it yeah i mean uh the thing to remember is that it's all an alternative to just simply guessing, which is far mm. worse. Yeah. So, um, you know, running experimentation is about is about obtaining the best confidence and the best data that you can in what to do. It's not mm. about obtaining perfect data and perfect confidence about what to do. But mm. the alternative is to just go, well, we should probably do this, you know, and 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 guess, yeah. and that and make, that it, make the what, button red. Yeah, and that is yeah. what really doesn't work. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, there are some, you know, there are some um, inherent risks in that. Now, more often than not, it's probably not going to be that much different. Um, yeah. And you can yeah. mitigate that by doing things like avoiding running tests, or at least being aware of running tests in sort of strange periods of time, like you know, right. around uh, Black Friday or something like that. Um, so there are things you can do, but yeah, again, it's um, important to remember that it's the best possible data you can, not the perfect data. Yeah, and I think what you've said it just before we move on, because we can talk, keep going. This is very interesting. But um, these five golden rules feel to me almost like principles or a contract that you need to have internally. Um, in my last business, we were we set up from scratch experimentation capability, bought in A/B testing tools, and launched a process and we fumbled honestly we fumbled around in the dark and screwed up a lot and uh, i don't think we ever got it right so but what this feels like is a contract to say okay we're not going to allow anyone most senior person in the room you know the, the director of e-commerce whoever we're all of us going to buy into say 
things like there's no such thing as a no-brainer right that's that's a principle of this team um you cannot use your own opinion as as a basis for hypothesis and um, we will not be spending time looking at the competition because we're unique and we etc cetera, etc cetera. um this feels like a code of conduct to me would that be a fair way to look at it i think so yeah, yeah. cool all right, great. OK, so I'm just going to move on, change it slightly now. So um, we're going to see a poll come up. Um, uh, cards on the table. We didn't quite work out the way to how to give you the score. It doesn't let you get your score once you've completed it. So we're going to give you the it gives you the points. Right. So if you can help us out here um, with our tech fail and just make a note of the, uh, the points for each question. The high points versus low points makes no difference. So yeah, don't don't cheat as it were. There's no point. Um, try to come out with an accurate score, and I'll tell you in a second how that um, where that sits you against all the people we're talking to. We're talking to some amazing brands across the world. So yeah, if you just want to take a few minutes or a minute just to answer those three questions and take a note of your score, and if you feel like you want to pop your score in the chat, you don't have to say which company you're from. Um, I think it might flag your name up. So if you don't want to be identified don't worry yeah drop your score in if you feel like it uh, and then we'll go from there um just whilst you're completing that we as part of our sales process we take every client through a version of this or potential client uh, it might seem a weird thing to do but what we've discovered um, again just uh, in the spirit of being open about this is that the success of our tools uh, our ai within people's businesses is only partially down to our tools and a lot of it the majority of it is down to adoption process and people and how ready the company is to actually integrate experimentation tools and processes so we use this as a way to help inform people as to how ready they are so what the pitfalls are and then um, that's why we've partnered with Journey further, because we're now offering to our clients who come on board and want to use iQuant, we're also offering them the wraparound support from Journey further to help them implement the whole process of experimentation, which we think long term is the best thing for the client, um, because they're so much bigger than just what we're doing. Um, hopefully, uh, we've got people answering that, have we, Gemma? Yep, I think I can end it now and then I can share the results. Okay. Yeah, well, just one sec, give everyone a, um, okay, done. Right, let's see the results. What are they? Hey, okay. should be able to see that. Okay, good. Interesting. Is that, can everyone see this? I think everyone should be able to, yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not everyone's answered it, so a small response right, right there, but it's okay. It typically follows what I would expect to see that, you know, yeah. uh, what, what we what we find is most people are doing some kind of experimentation, but they're not necessarily yeah. doing it effectively. It's a very, A-B testing particularly is a very strange thing in that it is ostensibly easy to do, like anybody can get an A-B testing tool and run a test. But doing it well and doing it properly is completely and utterly different ball game altogether. And yeah. there are very, very few people that do it effectively. You've even got situations where, I mean, I, I run management consulting, uh, helping businesses scale up their um, AV testing programs. Yeah. And very often I'll find, you know, people in-house running programs where really they may as well not have bothered because they, they're unwittingly doing it so incorrectly that um you know they're probably not really achieving very much out of it um yeah. so it's and i'm not suggesting anybody here is doing that i'm just saying it's a very strange thing where it's it's very possible to coast along doing it without ever realizing um that there's a far better way and things like that yeah. so yeah and, and that's what we're seeing as well so with uh, all the, the companies talking to hundreds of companies um as we go along and yeah, the, the, the range of scores. So anywhere who's scoring naught to seven, if you if you took a note of your scores, naught to seven, um, naught to nine, actually, we see most companies at naught 
to nine. We see very few companies. So I say 80, we look at about 80% of our people coming through to the sales process are scoring naught to nine. Twenty uh, percent are getting ten and above. That's hardly, you know, it's, it's not a massive amount. It's still a very new discipline. I liken it to agile and the introduction of agile methodologies. Which, if you think about now, if you're not you're not in engineering, but you probably do stand ups, uh, for example, uh, you probably think about um, sprints. These are all things that have come across from the world of engineering. Um, same with experimentation. I think we're now going to see a slow adoption and growth as people start to implement this way of working. So yeah, if you're in, if you're scoring less than ten, don't panic. You're along. You're in the same place as a lot of other people. If you're above ten, thumbs up. Congratulations to you, because you're one of the minority at this point. Um, conscious of time, so let's keep going. So a um, little quick section here on the right culture for experimentation. So. Um, there are four pillars um, to this, as, as we see it. Consistent data, which we'll come on to these. Curious mindset, goal alignment, and having a great toolbox. Some good tools in it, obviously. Um, so let's dig into those. Um, those are all underpinned, of course, by people and skills. So having the right people and skills and the right process. I'm just going to... For today just stick on the top four but just think about that that the foundations of those things are having the right people and skills and the right processes and so therefore the point here is these things can't always happen overnight there has to be a consistent shift towards this culture and culture as you all know is, is something that takes time to change so consistent data this is absolutely essential uh, again real world example of how it was badly done by me my last business we um, and um, this was some years ago, right? so I can't speak for them now. It's not a comment on them now. But they, uh, what we had was we had Microsoft BI, a business intelligence platform. We had analysts who just created report after report after report, and some of which were, we couldn't work out whether they were similar, the same data, different. Everybody started drawing absolutely different conclusions from very similar data, but not the same data. And nobody knew which report to run, and you get presented with insights and like, which report did you use? No one knew, or they knew, and it was you'd never seen it before because it was hidden in a different part of the application. Um, so it's vital to have consistent data um, that you use the same data to to analyze and draw your conclusions as a group. Um, so think about how that data, if you're an analyst or you have access or to that team, think about how that data is currently presented. The consumers of that data is it easy to consume? Because if it's not, it's going to make it really hard. Is it consistent? If you've got too much, and it's going to lead to confusion. And can people easily access the data they need? As Johnny said a while ago, the data is the basis of all your hypotheses, not personal opinion. So if you don't have this part, it's very hard to drive the culture. Curious mindset. This is absolutely essential. Are you hiring the right people? or just pretending to. A lot of companies claim to be, you know, this is who we hire, this is the type of person we want. But are you actually, what are you doing in the hiring process to identify these people? You know, are you, for example, putting tests to them in the scenarios to them in the, 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 in the hiring process that replicate a real challenge you have in the business and seeing how they respond? Are you hiring someone that will just wants to be told what to do or someone that's prepared to challenge and ask questions and go and be an investigator? because the latter is what you really want if you're a leader on this call um what is your attitude to empowering your team or are you the type of leader that's shutting them down ask yourself that question do you really genuinely encourage your team to make mistakes and learn and that's the outcome do you really encourage your team to learn by making mistakes and and honestly look at your own behaviors and the process you've been in place to see whether or not the team have that empowerment and if you're not the team leader, what is your team leader's attitude? And can that be changed? Because without that permission to go and just try stuff within the bounds of the company goals and strategy, you're not going to, without that permission, you're going to fail. Um, moving on, then, talk about goal alignment. This is absolutely vital. Uh, we use OKRs here at Icon. Google use OKRs. Lots of companies use objectives and key results. Um, other people use other management frameworks and objective setting frameworks. 
the most important thing is that they're set and they're consistent and they flow through the organization and that everybody knows what they're trying to achieve. Are they clear and inspire confidence in individuals to take action of their own accord? Or is everyone waiting to be told what to do? This is vital. We think OKRs are fantastic because we focus on the outcomes and then we let people get on with trying to achieve them. I don't know how they're going to achieve the outcome, but I know they're going to go on and give it a try and try different things until they do. So giving them that freedom to operate and use their brains and their training and their expertise as opposed to me or someone senior telling them what to do is really important um, and making sure they know what goals they're attached to. Um, and we've talked about freedom just now and are they complementary or competing to other teams? And that's vital too. Look at the goals. Is your marketing team competing against your product team? In which case, it's never going to work. So you have to put time into making sure that there's this complete alignment across the business that lets people get on and experiment. And then finally, having a great toolbox. Um, what's your process end to end? And how the tools you've got mapped? We're going to have it. There's a section coming up on all the tools in a second. Two slides. And we've talked about how to map those tools to the process. But have a process. You know, what happens when you drop a coin in the top? How does it flow through? Does everyone know exactly how to use the tools and the expectations of them of when to use them in the process? Or do you rely on people to remember to use them? It's really important. You may have a really expensive tool sitting there that you, you say to yourself, well, did you use this tool on? No, I didn't. Why not? Oh, I didn't remember to. Well, that's the worst outcome. If you've got a tool, it should be slotted into your process. And we coach all our customers on this make sure you know where all of these fit things fit in and when to use them and write that down and have everyone follow that process and also identify what's missing because you may be simply going oh we can't even a b test you know it's pretty tough then to experiment uh, or we don't have the right data capabilities we don't have the right skill sets to identify the tools that are missing so that was a sort of a, a quick whiz through uh, of those things um obviously you can get more of that in the recording Hopefully that was useful. So we're going to move on now um, to that process I just talked about. John, back to you. Building a process of continuous experimentation. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, testing should be a, a process of research, test, learn, research, test, learn. So broadly, you know, what you're doing is, number one, understanding goals, exactly like Charlie talked about, aligning the goals to what's important in the business, uh, identifying what you need to be focusing on, running research, coming up with ideas, and then designing and testing those ideas with real customers. And again, that in an ideal world is, is A-B testing. It doesn't have to be, it can be, you know, if, if you can't do that for whatever reason, it could be a form of validation, but ultimately you learn from those tests, feed that back into the research. The reason we wanted to talk about this is really to go on to um, the, the number of tools that you need and understanding how software and tools fits into this. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are different kinds of tools that you can use all the way along the journey um, for um, project management and strategy for research and um coming up with ideas um we we extensively use iquant at three different areas of this um this process for running research for um iterative design and also for evaluating tests um but in the interest of time just to go on what we're going to look at here is the is the experimentation part of it so just as an example how do you um, how do you decide which of these tools that you need? And A-B testing is an interesting area because it, it, ostensibly A-B testing tools are all very similar. Um, but how do you choose? And these are some of the questions that you might want to ask yourself. Um, so who is going to use the A-B testing tool? A-B testing tools have within them what's called a what you see is what you get editor or no code editor where in theory you're supposed to be able to drag and drop things and you know not know anything about coding languages. They don't work very well. Responsive web design means that they're very hard to use. The alternative is to use a code editor or some kind of hybrid. But anyway, that all comes down to um, whether you have development resources to use it or you know who somebody with those sorts of skills. Um, who, where is it gonna sit in your process? So 
uh, you know, is somebody in marketing running tests or are you, is it your actual engineering team that are running tests and things that they build? That will tell you whether you need a, a client side tool or a service side tool. Um, what's the complexity of your code? Um, there are nuances in the tools around that. And then things like traffic volumes affect the um, commercial side of it. Um, and, you know, are you going to be able to run statistical analysis outside of it? Um, let's move on because I think we don't really have a huge amount of time left. So those are the sorts of questions that you might want to ask yourself. What we wanted to um, go through here is a case is a case study. We shouldn't take too long, but um, Liberty London, if you don't know, are a it's a it's a department store, a very iconic department store in London, a luxury department store. But they have a very strong presence online as well, selling all the products from their department store. So it's an online um, multi-category retailer, effectively. Um, and we work with them extensively running experimentation for them. If you flick on. Um, so uh, the background here is uh, what, you're, what you're seeing here is, a, is an older version of their desktop site um, and they have this really unconventional vertical navigation where the navigation is permanently sitting at the left hand side of the screen in a vertical uh, setup and um, it was created as a, in a very sort of deliberate attempt to be unconventional really like you know they decided they wanted to branch out and be different and represent something different um, arguably, you shouldn't really do that with the UX of your website, but nevertheless, they did. Anyway, we we originally started running research, and we found, particularly from user research and from digital experience analytics, that people were struggling to find the search bar. Um, you, you know, it's it's very normally in the top right hand side of the screen. So you, you know, if you want to go to search, your eyes would just float to the top right hand of the, kind of the screen. Um, and we found that people couldn't weren't weren't using it, couldn't find it. And um, so we, we wanted to test a horizontal navigation, a more conventional navigation. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, um, the first challenge that we had was actually obtaining permission to do that, because like I said, it, was, it had been a quite a big political decision to, to design the site that way. They'd never had a culture of running experiments before. They just had a culture of everybody deciding what they liked and going with it. Um, so what we did was to use Iquant initially to, to demonstrate why it might be of value. And we mocked up a very rough version of the site as we saw it might, how it might look with a horizontal navigation. And we were able to show that um, just from redesigning it like that and just from the data in Iquant, which is using AI to predict what would happen if you did a eye tracking study that the visibility of the search icon alone was 150 percent better in the redesign and that alone just allowed us to to get permission to run this test and to, and to push it forward as a test so on the next step um we ran a phase one test where we were just testing the ui so what you're seeing there is a is is just a redesign of the navigation where everything's put in a horizontal um format at the top of the screen. Now, this, was, this wasn't absolutely perfect because the taxonomy, i.e. the categories within those categories and how they're structured didn't necessarily fit in the perfect way, but we wanted to just test the concept first. So this was quite a, almost like a quick and dirty test, really. It was, it was, it was to 20% of the traffic um, and, and, we, and for, a, for a fixed period of time. What we found though was was instantly quite remarkable. The use of search increased by thirty percent. The use of the my account link increased by thirty eight percent, and overall the conversion rate increased um, uh, by eight percent, which is huge. So we knew that we were we could go on to the next stage. The next stage was to sort out the taxonomy. So we ran a piece of, uh, amongst other bits of research, we ran a, ran a card sorting analysis where we recruited users and got them to arrange products and category and products categories of products into groupings to basically come up with a redesign of the taxonomy. Um, and that was done in conjunction with thinking about structurally, how would it fit into the website and the different viewports and things like that. So this is just to scratch the surface um, slide to show you that. 
Um, and then the and then the next stage was to actually run the full test. So we run a, a full test of 100% of traffic, 50-50 split with the new navigation, the taxonomy. That actually overall increased the average revenue per user by 14%, which is worth four million pounds to them. But that sort of demonstrates that end-to-end -end process that I talked about. So, you know, first using research to come up with ideas, uh, testing those ideas, but very importantly, the process of validation that goes with uh, different steps, understanding whether or not something's worth carrying on. And we talked very right at the beginning about statistics. So I'm not going to give you a lesson in statistics, but um, I guess the, the simple thing to leave you with is um, it is very important. AV testing is sampling, which means statistics. So you, you have to understand it. AV testing tools themselves never do statistics very well. Um, it's kind of deliberate. They want you to be finding winning tests and then having a nice time and renewing your contract. Um, but they don't, they don't give you the right information. Um, the right information is really based around the sample size and they never deal with that. So if you take one thing away, just understand that the vast majority of people don't understand it. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I actually run training courses on, on this a lot and that are designed to allow people with no real maths background to understand it to a level of, you know, getting it right from a business point of view. But however you do it, you need to understand it. Um, it's very important. And um, if, you, if you want us to do more on statistics and you want to maybe learn about that, then uh, drop us an email. You can send it to gemra at and G E W M A, and we can uh, we can sort of try and bring that up. Perhaps do a short focus session on it. Um, just before everyone goes, uh, we promised that there would be um, some some free giveaways. So this is the start of it. Um, we've got one couple more minutes left, and then we're free to go. Um, we wanted to offer you. It's the first time we've done this, but we want to offer a working session in four weeks' time, just for the people that stuck out to the end here. And actually, we've had amazing retention. The number has not changed since the beginning of the call. Everyone stayed on, so that's fantastic. Um, but for those of you that are left on the call, um, we'd like to offer you to come back in four weeks. We'll send out just to you the uh, some dates and have a very open dis working discussion on the Chatham House rules. So what you bring, we kept private within the group. Um, but uh, take these as a challenge. Run some experiments, create the foundations, focus on the risk, learn to speak the right thing, financial language, bring in the outside voice, don't give up. Take that away. If you've been stuck or blocked um, and or you've just started experimenting, I'm not sure what to do next. Go away, do another test, come back to us in four weeks and talk us through it. And we will do what we can to help you and give you advice in that session. So that's the first thing we wanted to, uh, to offer you. Um, the other thing we've got is we've got five open slots, no charge. We're calling them kickstart slots, first come, first serve basis uh, to help you get started. So if you're coming away from this call feeling motivated and excited, and think, I just want to get on with this, I'm not sure where to start, grab one of those slots. Just email gemma at icon.com and put kickstart slot in the subject line and try and grab one of those five. Um, and we'll get back to you if you're lucky. And that will be a chance to sit with um, Johnny and me. And we'll give you advice and help you get going. So there's no charge, but this is us just trying to help drive experimentation culture out there and get people talking about it and as another thank you for attending if that wasn't enough uh, you can only get icon today on the website free for seven days we want to give it to you for a month for free um, and it's not available anywhere else and that's a thank you from us um, so if you want that free trial for a month and can really use it as much as you like on any of your sites any of your experimentation any in your design process Email salesicon.com with webinar in the subject. So there's two emails there. There's the Gemma at Icon. If you want one of those kickstart slots, put that in the subject line. Or if you want to get, also if you want to get a free Icon for a month, then put email sales at Icon.com with webinar in the subject line. And every, everyone on the call can have one of those. There's not a limited number. We'd like you all to have one. So um, we just remain for us to say thanks so much for your time. Uh, we hope that was useful. We've really tried to make it practical and focused on you taking things away. Don't forget, in four weeks, we're offering you a chance to come back in a different format and have a more of a discussion with us and share what you've done and perhaps pop up a presentation of a slide or so and 
let's discuss it and see how we can help you. So do come back and be part of this community with us. And if you need any help in the meantime, email us anyway and we'll see what we can do. Um, but Johnny, thanks to you. I really appreciate you giving up your time. Is there anything last thoughts you want to leave everyone with? Uh, no, just test everything. <laughs> test everything. That's it. Test everything. Um, and one, Gemma, one other thing I would just say is, uh, yeah. is I, I, I talk about this stuff a lot on LinkedIn. So please follow me on LinkedIn or connect to me there on LinkedIn. Go. There's a plug. There's a plug. There you go. Follow Johnny on LinkedIn. He's only got four followers, so he wants some more followers. No, he's not. He's got a thousand. But um, yeah, thanks again to you all. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks to Gemma for organising this. And we hope to see you maybe in about four weeks' time. And we'll keep an eye out for your emails. Take care, everyone. Thank you.